Hi, this is Andy Barnett, Bishop's Chair for Environmental Studies in the Episcopal Diocese of Los Angeles, here to talk to you about water pollution and treatment. The big idea is that we treat wastewater, protect aquatic ecosystems, and clean our drinking water. The essential question is, what happens when we flush the toilet? And why do we care? Because according to the World Health Organization, 1.1 billion people lack access to sufficient drinking water. Half of the 3.1 million annual deaths from diarrheal disease and malaria could have been prevented with safe drinking water and proper sanitation and proper hygiene. So question one, you can go ahead and pause the video here. Why care about water treatment? Welcome back. Another reason to care about water treatment is because if you're interested in development and making a difference in people's lives around the world, especially in developing countries, one of the quickest ways to make people healthier is to get them clean drinking water and make sure that sewage is getting treated properly. So here are some core concepts to help you do that. The first is a point source pollutant. As you can see in the picture here, it comes from a specific place, like a factory or a ship or a well. Point source pollution is easier to regulate and trace. Typically, it comes in more concentrated pollution. And the regulation is basically uh, sending um, regulators to test the effluent or to test the lake water. They're looking for specific chemicals at specific times by official regulators. And they can trace that usually back to a few likely point source pollutants. Non-point source pollutants, by contrast, come from a diffuse area like a farming region, a suburban area, or a highway corridor. They're harder to regulate, typically have dilute pollution, but the accumulated effects, effects can add up. And one of the most common examples of this is agricultural runoff. As you can see in this river here, there's just a ton of topsoil flowing down the river. So though the effluent can rarely be traced to a single origin, typically the policies to address non-point source pollutants are going to have to look at land use and best practices for that. For example, farmland within a certain distance of streams uh, is often required to remain unplowed keeping topsoil and fertilizer out of the streams. Next we have oxygen demanding waste. This is pollution that stimulates aerobic microbe growth and those microbes require oxygen to decompose waste so eventually dissolved oxygen drops and ecosystems are harmed. If the dissolved oxygen is low enough you get dead zones and that's what happens where most aquatic species cannot survive. We'll talk about how they form. Dissolved oxygen measures the concentration of oxygen in aqueous solution. In other words, how much oxygen is dissolved in the water? So in this picture you can see there's a lot of bubbles. And when oxygen is dissolved you actually wouldn't be able to see it in the water. But the bubbles you see in that picture indicate that aeration has taken place. And aeration increases dissolved oxygen. Artificially, you can just basically blow bubbled air into the water and it'll add solid oxygen. In aquatic ecosystems, waterfalls and, and rapids and fast currents uh, typically help with aeration. And that's why those are great places to go fishing because the fish are going for the, uh, well actually the fish and the food is going where there's more oxygen. Okay, biological oxygen demand. This one's a little bit hard to understand. It's basically a, a, a lab test. And what you're looking at here is how much oxygen did the living things in the water use over a certain period of time? In other words, how much oxygen did they gulp out of the water? How oxygen hungry is this ecosystem? What you do is you take a, sam a water sample of a given size. You incubate it at a known temperature for a known period of time, usually five days, and you see how much oxygen the microbes used. The more oxygen they used, the higher the biological oxygen demand, the more chomping that was happening, and the more likely that water sample is to eventually become a dead zone. 
So this is a picture of the instrument that's used to measure biological oxygen demand over five days, usually abbreviated as BOD5. Please stop here and answer the next three questions for understanding. Moving on, aerobic bacteria. This is pretty basic and you probably know this already. These are bacteria that thrive in the presence of oxygen, bacteria who, who need oxygen to live. By contrast, anaerobic bacteria thrive in the absence of oxygen. And these, we think, are some of the oldest life forms on Earth. The nitrogen cycle. This one's fun. Before we dive into the specifics, Remember this big idea. Our atmosphere is 78% nitrogen, but our bodies can't use it. We breathe it in and we breathe it right out. To give you an idea of how much energy it takes to turn nitrogen gas into a biologically available form of either nitrate or nitrite, that reaction happens naturally in lightning. Tons of heat, tons of pressure. Very intense reaction. Fortunately, there's some species of plants called legumes that have evolved enzymes that can fix nitrogen atmospheric temperatures and pressures. That's how nature does it. Now here's how we do it. American bomb factories, and actually bomb factories around the world, um, after World War II, realized they needed a new product to make. So they started making fertilizer. You heard me right. A similar process that had built bombs was now used to fix nitrogen in fertilizer. It is super energy intense fertilizer. But through this new technique called the Haber-Bosch process, humans would double the amount of bioavailable nitrogen on Earth. And since most of that nitrogen goes to our food, it passes through us or through the animals that we eat and sewage treatment plants have to turn nitrates and nitrates back into nitrogen gas. So below you're going to look at the steps of the cycle. For our purposes, you don't have to memorize the cycle, but just know that certain steps of the process require aerobic in the presence of oxygen bacteria, and other steps require anaerobic bacteria. The main goal, and this is really important, the main goal of secondary treatment is to take organic matter, which is carbon-based, and turn it into CO2. Then to take nitrates and nitrites and turn them into N2 gas. To do this, we need both aerobic and anaerobic conditions. We'll talk about that more in just a little bit. All right, let's take a little tour of the nitrogen cycle. Up here in the sky, we've got nitrogen in the atmosphere. First thing that happens is nitrogen gas is fixated or fixed into ammonia, NH3. Then ammonia turns into nitrite, NO2 minus, and nitrate. That process is called nitrification. When nitrate jumps back up into ammonia, that's called assimilation. Oh, sorry, sorry, nitrate goes into plants, that's called assimilation. And then animals into plants, animals release waste, that's back into ammonification, it goes back through. Another thing that can happen is nitrate can pop back up here into nitrogen gas, that's called denitrification. Now this piece right here is really important for sewage treatment because we're trying to take nitrate out of the water. The reason we're trying to take nitrate out of the water is because of eutrophication, which we'll talk about in a minute. But first, riddle me this. Fill in the table here and use the image in red to complete the chart. Then ask, why do sewage treatment plants manipulate the dissolved oxygen content in various tanks? What are they trying to get rid of, and how are they trying to get rid of it?
This brings us to eutrophication. Eutrophication happens in six steps. Basically, nitrates, potassium, and phosphates in the form of fertilizer enter the water. These fertilizers stimulate an algae bloom and eventually the plants die. Decomposing and aerobic bacteria goes to town eating the dead algae. As they respire, they require oxygen. Water clarity is reduced, less sunlight enters, the deeper water temperature stratification harms aquatic habitat, dissolved oxygen drops, many species can no longer live in the dead zone. Now here's the dead zone that's formed in the, in the Gulf of Mexico as a result of the Mississippi River draining a third of the central part of the continent. Actually, a third of the continent, which is the central part of the continent. So take a minute here and find a picture that explains the process of eutrophication and explain the steps that lead from nitrogen and phosphorus pollution to a dead zone. Remember, one of the main reasons we care about water treatment is because it makes a huge difference in public health. So disease-causing bacteria typically come from water that's been exposed to either industrial waste or animal waste or human waste. And when, when uh, investigators are trying to figure out what's the cause of the sickness, they'll often look for what they call indicator species, which means species that would tell you it most likely had contact with whatever, in this case, human waste. Fecal coliform bacteria is one of the most common indicator species used in those tests. So cholera is like the most preventable and the most deadly of these issues because basically if you get poop in the water, people are going to get cholera. Um, and if you don't treat it, they'll die from dehydration and it's super, super preventable and super sad. This picture comes from Zimbabwe where they had treated over 45,000 cases of cholera when the economy entirely collapsed and they were, able to, they were no longer able to treat water. So, how to treat waste and how to reduce pollution and how to keep drinking water safe. If you have like no resources, you can lose the, use latrines. If you're in a rural area with some resources, you can use septic systems. As you can see here, the wastewater is a central section, which then flows into a drain field. Then if we're looking at sewage treatment plants, there's a couple options three categories of treatment. The first is primary, using gravity and settling. Second, secondary, using bacteria to convert organic matter into carbon dioxide and inorganic nutrients. And finally, tertiary, which, uses, which is a final scrub to kill and remove pathogens. Pause here to answer question seven. In primary treatment, you use gravity to let particles settle out of solution. Big particles sink faster than slow particles. So if you want to remove smaller and smaller particles, you have to leave the water in the tank for a longer period of time. Before running the effluent through the tanks, we first pass it through big metal bars to remove large objects like logs and other big things. Then we pass it through a grit removal box to avoid abrasion on the plant pipes. And finally, we let it sit in tanks like this. Here's a diagram of what that tank looks like on the bottom. It's a cone. The sewage flows in the top and the sludge flows out at the bottom. You can actually calculate the settling time for a particle based on its radius and density. And the sludge that collects at the bottom of the tank is dried and either spread on farm fields if it doesn't have toxic metals, or it's taken to a landfill if it does. Pause here for question eight. In secondary treatment, we use bacteria to convert organic compounds, which are carbon-based, into CO2 and nitrates and nitrites into N gas, nitrogen gas. Here, plant operators manipulate the amount of dissolved oxygen to figure out whether they're going to have aerobic or anaerobic bacteria, which will then move the water through the different steps of the nitrogen cycle. Pause here for question nine. Tertiary treatment is a final scrub to remove pathogens and other organics. I've given you a list of options here which compare price, effectiveness, and unintended consequences. And finally, I want to flag another issue that faces wastewater treatment, which is salt removal, toxics removal, and an alternative technology which mimics the properties of a wetland to clean water using gravity, soil, bacteria, plants, and filter feeders.